Hello, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Eric Hughes and I'm a regenerative specialist for osteogenics. Before we get started, let me address how we'll be interacting today. From a technical perspective, we can't hear or see you, but we would love to hear from you and be able to answer any questions that you may have. There's a Q&A button on the right-hand side of your screen where you can type your questions at any time, and we'll try to get them answered during the Q&A portion of the webinar. Now to introduce our presenter. Dr. Maurice Salama completed his undergraduate studies at the State University of New York at Binghamton in 1985, where he received his BS in biology. He then went on to graduate school to receive his DMD from the University of Pennsylvania School of Dental Medicine. Dr. Salama completed a one-year general practice and surgical residency at Momonides Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York from 1989 to 1990, where he was named chief resident. Dr. Salama later returned to the University of Pennsylvania and received his dual specialty certification in orthodontics and periodontics, as well as his implant training at the Brandenburg Center at Penn. Dr. Slama is currently on the faculty of the University of Pennsylvania and Augusta University as a clinical assistant professor of periodontics. Dr. Slama is a founder and a permanent member of the scientific committee of the world's leading online dental education website, Dental XP. Dr. Slama and his team have published numerous scientific papers, book chapters, and periodicals in peer reviewed journals and he's often invited as a keynote speaker and featured speaker at dental conferences around the world. Dr. Salama is also the CEO of the Salama Training Centers in Miami and now in Romania, which offers year-long implant mastership residency programs in the USA and in Europe. Dr. Salama, thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight for this presentation. Thank you so much, Eric. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you, Osteogenics, for the invitation to speak on a really, really great topic. You know, my focus has always been on the interaction and education with my colleagues around the world, as you know, and um, in particular, the posterior maxilla, managing that area has been a, an aspect and focal point of implant treatment for many, many years. And with technology has advanced tremendously over the past decades. So uh, in 2023, uh, you know, you look at how we did things uh, classically uh, with a lateral approach to the sinus and today how many of us can do it with a more minimally invasive procedure using new technologies and then also new materials and new biologics. So I'm going to focus my attention predominantly on the focal point between lateral approaches and crustal approaches and why, sh when and how should we decide when to use one approach over the other. One of the biggest things about being able to present, especially through a webinar, is to understand that these are a conduit for further education. And I think any education that you receive anywhere in the world through any source should involve some form of formal didactic, like this evening, lecture format, but also hands-on training. And um, with that being said, and what you mentioned, Eric, is that I do have Salama training centers and implant mastership programs, which are all hands-on, now available in the United States, uh, just around Miami, as well as one now in Europe, in Romania and Bucharest. Uh, and we're very, very excited. The first year is graduating in a few weeks here in Miami and uh, the one in Europe starting in September. And we're very, very excited about being able to engage our colleagues around the world and share uh, not only the the biological and scientific aspects, but also the technical and hands-on aspects of doing these types of procedures. So with that said, we offer six modules in this year-based program. It's done every two months. They're all two-day programs with a hands-on uh, aspect to each and every program. So you not only get to see the didactic format, the science and biology, but also get an opportunity of working on specimens, pig jaws and models using all of the uh, technology and the materials that uh, are going to be highlighted in this program especially but also with every other module. So you have bone, sinus, soft tissue, full arch, restorative dentistry and of course sinus and this is one of the programs and if you want any further information on any of these programs which can be taken collectively as a mastership program or individually you can find that information at the website at the bottom of the screen, www.salamatraining.com. 
So if we look at lateral versus crustal approaches, why should we even dis make a decision on which way to go? What is the factors that would lead a person who's watching this webinar to make a decision? And I think before you can consider a technique, it is much more of an issue of diagnosis, prognosis, and selection. And I say this so importantly because I can train almost anyone to do a lateral or crestal approach, but if you don't select the right individual to perform them on, then you are going to end up with some complications and some potential uh, disasters and failures. And with sinuses in particular, we want to avoid that and we're going to discuss some of those aspects in a moment. If you look at the left side of your screen, you'll see a classical lateral approach. This can be done through um, hand speed instrumentation and motors, or it can be done through piezoelectric technology. I uh, am very fond of the piezo surgery, who's also a, a supporter of our programs, to access the lateral wall without tearing the Schneiderian membrane, and then using basic instrumentology to lift that sinus all the way to the medial wall and being able to create a large enough space for us to access the sinus and to graft the sinus. Now what you see on the right part of your screen is a crestal approach. And the crestal approach, what are the advantages? The flaps are minimal. We are not making large windows which are 20 or 30 millimeters in circumference to access the lateral wall, we're actually entering the sinus through the crest. And by entering the sinus through the crest, the advantages are minimally invasive procedure, less, uh, less potential for complications, and certainly minimal swelling and edema post-surgically. The challenges are, how do we see what we're doing? How do we know that we've lifted the Schneiderian membrane without tearing it? And we'll get into those in just a moment. So, Two different procedures, but anyone who's watching this evening, I think if you see the left and right screen, would know clearly that the right side certainly at least appears to be a much less invasive procedure. Some of the early techniques back in the early 90s, Bob Summers described the technique of osteotome sinus lips for small bumps of the sinus using a mallet. And although very, very today, considering today's techniques, archaic, uh, it was the first form of a crestal procedure. The problem is with malleting and using osteotomes, some of the problems that we ran into was patients with, with uh, getting post-operative vertigo, uh, ringing in the middle ears, and of course, those problems can become quite debilitating. What happened after that was the opportunity to advance our techniques, and that started with balloon technology. The ability to access the sinus through the crest, as you see in this image, it's a singular site. It would be a shame to have to lift the whole lateral wall. And the middle screen showing you how we teach this technique during one of our hands-on programs at our training center. So we use either balloons, or today I'm gonna to share with you either uh, osteodensification techniques or using hydrodynamic techniques to lift the sinus through a crestal approach. What's great is if you look at the left and right screen, you see the right part of the screen, which is a negative x-ray, you see that we have substantial sinus lift and bone augmentation being done through a crestal approach from with more than 10 millimeters. And this was done through a balloon approach, expanding the Schneiderian membrane with a balloon and then introducing the bone through the crest without using a classical lateral approach. So we're going to come back to these series of questions at the end of my program today. So let's ask ourselves the questions. Regarding sinus augmentation, number one, when to consider a crestal versus lateral approach? What techniques are available for crestal access? Is bone grafting a requirement for successful sinus augmentation? How much residual crestal bone is required for simultaneous implant placement? And how much of a sinus lift can we expect with a crestal approach? If we go back to some of the original uh, articles that first even discussed this technology, really goes back to almost 40 years or more where Hill Tatum, Phil Boyne, 
and Carl Misch published on this procedure through a lateral, a lateral access point on the sinus. And what we saw is that the sinus floor uh, elevation procedure has evolved over the last 40 years, is recognized as one of the most predictable procedures for dental implant placement in the se severely atrophic maxilla. So I don't think there's any reason to avoid the sinus. I think we can get excellent results and it has a great regenerative potential. A minimal amount of three millimeters of crestal bone height has been a suggested prerequisite for simultaneous implant placement during sinus of procedures. Also, there's been discussions over a one-step versus a two-step approach. And of course, primary implant stabilities and achieving parallelism are a significant concern when we only have a minimal amount of crestal bone to stabilize our implants. We're going to come back to that as we go through the, this uh, presentation. The classical floor augmentation procedure is a sinus access window that occurs below the floor of the existing sinus and then allows us to access the Schneider membrane and lift it all the way to the medial wall, creating a space so we can place an implant and a bone graft simultaneously, and then a membrane on the outside, typically I use a long acting collagen matrix from osteogenics to secure that area. And then of course, tax to fixate that collagen window, that collagen coverage of the window. If we look at the literature, we see that in an article that was published back in 2018 in the International Journal of Oral Maxillofacial Implants, the three-year survival rate and follow-ups on these cases using a classical approach has been extremely high. We don't seem to have an issue being able to access the sinus and get a great regenerative result. The big question is, can we do it minimally invasively? And if we can, when should we institute this? So let's take a look at a patient, as you see in this particular uh, case, we have a series of implants that were placed in the canine and bicuspid region. And then we have a sinus that only has a minimal amount of two to three millimeters of remaining residual crestal bone available. And if you see what we're looking at here, the decision has to be made as to whether to access the sinus through the crest, as you see here, the green arrows, or should we access the sinus laterally? And I'm gonna go through some of the ways that I make that decision, and I hope it'll help some of you make the appropriate decision, because I believe that making the right decision in these cases is as important as understanding how to perform these procedures. One of the biggest aspects that you should look at when considering Kressel approach is addressing the width of the posterior maxilla and alveolus. It's not just the remaining height that you see on the left screen, but equally important, if not more important, is the remaining residual width that you see on the right screen. And to me, that minimum width is five millimeters. If I have a narrow ridge, typically I'm going to prefer to go through a lateral access approach because therefore you can address the lateral approach and the alveolar ridge deficiency simultaneously using GBR. So here we have a wide ridge, more than five millimeters. We have three millimeters of a residual crest and I can now enter the crest through a vertical approach, through the crest itself, not laterally. And if you look at the screen here, just a number of different techniques and tools that are available today. We have neurosurgical drills, diamond burrs, we have piezoelectric technology, we have Versa technology, and we have hydrodynamic technology as well. Here, I'm entering the sinus using a diamond drill that allows me to drill through the bone and it has millimeter markings on it. So I know exactly what the measurement is to the floor of the sinus and I can drill until I feel a give. And that diamond bird that's turning at high speed will cut the bone, but should not cut the Schneiderian membrane. So here I go down to my depth of about three millimeters. You see the diamond tip is now through the crest. 
And then I can go in and access the sinus through a vertical approach using vertical instrumentology. And here we're using mushroom and cobra tips that allow us to push the sinus very gently with a wide diameter, wide circumference of these instruments. So here you can clearly see the remaining residual crest of about two to three millimeters. And that cobra or mushroom tip can now enter the sinus and start lifting the Schneiderian membrane away from the lateral walls or the bordering walls of my access. And if you look at this, you can do the same thing or initiate the same concept with the piezo surgery tips. They have the same type of mushroom tips or tulip tips that you see here that can start the lift at the point between the access and the surrounding Schneiderian membrane. So the really very important is to get some technology. I think trying to do this with uh, standard curettes or standard instrumentation is going to become very challenging. If you choose to do this, I think learning it and getting the right technology and the right biologic materials are very critical. So to me, if you look at this now, we're entering the ridge of the sinus through the crest, not through a lateral window. We have enough space because it's a wide ridge to enter it and to be able to visualize it. I can clearly see, as you can see on this image, um, if you're viewing this, that it's clear that you can see the Schneider membrane. You can make sure that there's no tear using the Valsalva procedure or even just irrigating with water and seeing the response from the patient, making sure that none of that water is going through a tear in the Schneiderian membrane. If there is a tear, you should be able to visualize it and you should be able to seal it with a collagen barrier. So here, one of the first things that I do is I will place a fibrin plug into the sinus. If you're using bioactive modifiers, such as a blood-borne bioactive material, such as PRF, I think it's a great opportunity to introduce that material first into the sinus. Uh, it will allow you to pack the bone against the, the fibrin that protects the Schneiderian membrane from any bone particles that you may use. So definitely the utilization of a collagen, uh, of a um, bio biological modifier like PRF. If you don't have that, you can also use a collagen dressing to um, allow yourself to seal off that Schneiderian membrane and protect it from the graft particles. What graft should you use in a Crestle approach? Well, one of the first things I, I consider is you want to utilize a fibrin plug or collagen dressing to protect the Schneiderian membrane or seal any micro tears that you may not have noticed when you initiate the procedure. Always check to make sure that there is no tear. You can do this either visually, or you can do it using a Valsalva procedure, or you can do it using water irrigation. That should show you whether or not the patient has any reaction to the introduction of water into that area. Also, placing a mirror over the access point and have the patient breathe, and if you see the mirror become fogged, then that usually is a sign that there's a small tear in the Schneiderian membrane. So there's multiple ways to verify whether or not you have an intact Schneiderian membrane. Regardless of those tests, I will always seal the Schneiderian membrane with either fibrin or collagen dressing or both, depending upon whether I actually see a tear or not. There's been quite a bit in the literature that has shown that there is a potential for getting incredible regenerative results in the sinus just utilizing PRF alone or no bone graft material whatsoever. It's really more about maintaining the space in the sinus for the blood clot and bone to fill. Now, the problem that you have when you don't use bone, at least in my um, personal uh, results that I've seen over time, is that you don't get the density of the bone at an earlier time frame. You, you're waiting longer 
for the bone to fill with adequate density. So I'm a big proponent of using PRF as a growth factor and to seal the membrane, but I do prefer to use bone grafting materials. It expedites the procedure. It allows us to come back later without having to wait for the bone to become more calcified. So here we suture the case. We wait approximately four to five months and we come back and now we can drill through the crest and place the implants into the sinus that has been grafted. So this was a delayed approach because we only had a few millimeters of residual crest, but some people will test the limits and place the implant simultaneously. It's really up to you. The biggest factor is the experience of the clinician and the density and ability to maintain parallelism and stability of the implant. The one thing you don't want to do is place an implant in this area without adequate stability because these implants can then fall into the sinus. And that's quite a complication to have to again go and retrieve them. So a delayed approach, a staged approach when you have minimal residual crest is not a bad way to go in these procedures. So here I place my implants in the uh, second bicuspid and first molar regions. You can see I have a nice wide ridge to place a wide implant. We come back later and we take our uh, impression coping transfer. And here's the implants placed in that sinus at six months. And you can see great bone density around the two implants that were placed in what was air previously. And you can see if we overlay that same um, screen of where the floor of the nose, floor of the sinus was, and you can see that those implants today are now suitable for restoration in newly regenerated space. Istvan Urban published back in 2010 about whether or not a residual crest amount of 3.5 millimeters was adequate. And what he suggested is with a two-stage procedure, he felt that this was a safe and predictable approach with minimal complications. And the complications can be managed successfully with now a negative effect on the clinical outcomes. And I'm certainly in agreement with what he found. So if you see a molar site here, um, rather than go ahead and place the implant through the extraction socket, I prefer to allow the bone to heal, come back at about four months, and then I can do the internal or crestal sinus lift utilizing same approach and placing the implant simultaneously. So staging the approach, I think, makes it safer. Doesn't always have to be done that way, but you can take a floor of the sinus that you see with the yellow dots on the left screen, and you can see that in a singular site with a minimally invasive crestal approach, we can lift that sinus more than 10 millimeters, and here we placed a 13 millimeter implant. So minimally invasive sinus augmentation. What are the questions you should be asking yourself if you're going to approach these cases and what manner should you approach them? So let's go through some simple concepts. Here you see a panoramic film, two areas with a sloping anterior wall of the sinus. We're going to trace that out. One of the first things I think you should do is know where the crestal bone is. You see that delineated with the green dots. The yellow line delineates the current floor and uh, geography, if you will, of the floor of the sinus. So as you can see, we have a minimal amount of crestal bone, especially in the area of the first molar. Um, and then as it slopes forward to the bicuspid area, you can see it starts to slope upward, what we call a sloping anterior wall of the sinus. If you look at the blue circle that I placed on the image, that's kind of the area that I would look at as the, the location of our bone graft. All you need is to be able to graft about that amount of bone to accommodate the implants that are going to be placed. I think sometimes what happens is we're placing way too much bone in these areas for the length of implants that we need. And typically in these cases, I'm placing 10 to 13 millimeter implants in my augmented sinuses. The last part of the puzzle is if you're going to go crestal, what is the information that you need to know? And here it is. I'm going to look at the CBCT image in three different aspects. I'm going to look at panoramic image, axial image, and sagittal image. 
and you can see minimal amount of crestal bone remaining and a sloping anterior wall. So I want to know two things. Is the ridge width greater than five millimeters? If it's less than five millimeters, I typically go to a lateral approach so I can augment the width of the ridge at the same time that I do the sinus augmentation. So five millimeters to me is important. Second thing is the ridge height. This is gonna be a little bit backwards to some of you watching, but the shorter, if it's less than five millimeters, I prefer to go to a crestal approach because I can clearly see and have visual um, confirmation of the Schneiderian membrane being raised without a tear. As you get a six, seven, and eight millimeter ridge, um, I know a lot of my colleagues say that that's when I would do a crestal approach, but in those cases, I don't think a crestal approach is what I do. I do a bump procedure just to get a couple of millimeters. And I think the reason is if you've ever tried to look through that crestal approach, when you're going five, uh, six, seven, or eight millimeters, you really can't see. You're kind of working blind. And with shorter implants that are now available, I don't see a reason not to consider a six, seven, or eight millimeter implant rather than a crestal approach. So a bump in those procedures. So in this case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna raise a crestal flap uh, in the keratinized tissue. We're gonna access utilizing a crestal approach. Here we're using drills with stoppers. There's a two millimeter drill and then a, a two millimeter stopper and then a three millimeter stopper that gets me past the floor and gets me into the sinus utilizing the neurosurgical drills that will not tear the Schneiderian membrane. It cuts bone, but will not cut soft tissue. Once I'm there, I verify that using the mushroom tipped instruments so I can see the sinus. I can see that I'm three millimeters. You can see those black laser markings. And I can do that to verify that I have access to sinus membrane. So here you can clearly see my rules. They're not everyone's rules. I'm just giving you my particular perspective here. A wide ridge and a short ridge are optimal for a crestal approach. It allows you to do that with clarity and the ability to visually confirm what you're seeing. So now what you're staring at is you're actually looking at the Schneiderian membrane. This is the left screen is what you would see Without magnification, the right screen is what I see utilizing my microscope. Clearly see a patent bluish tint in the Snyderian membrane is now accessible only a few millimeters below the crest. So this happens to be, to me, an ideal way to approach a case like this. Now, how do we lift the Snyderian membrane without tearing it? Today, I would suggest a hydrodynamic approach. Either I use osteodensification or I use water. One of the first things that I use is use a piezo tip. And those piezo tips have water spray. And this is based on a concept that was uh, first highlighted by Professor Dong Sun out of Korea, who called this the HIPSE technique or HIPSE tip the hydrodynamic piezoelectric internal sinus elevation procedure. So I again can place this tip into that crestal access point and use the water spray to lift the Schneiderian membrane away from the internal aspects of the sinus wall. I can then go in there and verify with my cobra tips that the Schneiderian membrane is being lifted. I can use the Valsalva procedure and of course, the water spray and the mirror to confirm that there is no tear in the Schneiderian membrane. And once I do this through both access points and on both sides, you can clearly see here on the far left part of the screen, you can see the Schneiderian membrane has been lifted away from the internal aspects of the sinus floor. And now I have the lift I need to introduce my bone graft materials. So once again, just verifying, and I'm gonna use these same instruments to pack my bone. But what's the first thing I do? In almost every one of my sinus cases, I will first introduce liquid flagell, just to take care of any bacteria that may be in the sinus. I use one cc of liquid flagell into the sinus, 
I will then introduce the PRF fibrin into the sinus. If you don't have bloodborne bioactive materials, you can use a collagen wound dressing from osteogenics. I pack that bone into the sinus. Here, because I have nice access and a wide ridge, I'm going to use the Encore, the allograft from osteogenics of 50 50 cortical cancellous mixture. This is what I prefer. You can go ahead and use the 70 30 as well. It, it resorbs uh, slower than the 50 50, but I'm a big fan of the 50 50 material for this procedure. I'm then going to go ahead and place my implants because I have good crestal bone support to stabilize my implants. I'm going to put fibrin over the crest and with a minimally invasive procedure without any lateral window opening, I can get two implants of adequate depth. I have a 13 millimeter and a 10 millimeter implant inserted and you can clearly see the yellow line where the floor was and after the procedure that very large 10 millimeter or more bump of the sinus that allows us to introduce the implant simultaneously. So again, minimally invasive, allowing us to deal with these procedures without significant windows being prepared. And if you take a look here, this is at about eight months post-op on the cone beam CT. You can see the green arrow above the posterior implant, and you can see that there is bone all the way around the apex of the implant. So one of the things that changed my perspective on hydraulic sinus elevation were two things. One was a novel grafting material that's a putty uh, using Nova bone. It's an alloplast, not, an a, not a xenograft and not an allograft. And it is a phosphosilicate material that resorbs at about 50% over the first five or six months. So we published an article on this back in 2012, over a decade ago, and we were quite fond of the utilization of this material for extraction sites. This material, as a putty, in combination with Versa drills, which I'm going to talk about in terms of osseodensification, or what they call a V-lift, a Versa lift, has really expanded my ability to treat these cases using a vertical crestal approach. So here's the article we published with George Katsakis, myself, and some of my colleagues. This was published in JOMI. And when we compared this material to a bovine bone min mineral material, this had superior qualifications to be used. It resorbed at a nice pace. It was easy to apply. It had a great applicator tip. And it started to focus and start to get us to think of well, how else can we use this, this really great and unique material. At about the same time or a year later, Ziv Mazor from Israel and his group published what he called the minimally invasive crestal approach technique. And when you look at it, he basically used the Nova Bone system, their cartridge delivery system, as one of the highlights of his article, meaning that without it, this is not something that he would perform. So he would either place the implant simultaneously or do it staged. And he would use the hydraulic pressure from the cartridge delivery system of the Nova Bone particles to push the sinus up with the putty. And here is one of the cases that was highlighted in the article. You can see a beautiful um, uh, area here where you have sort of a little mushroom or dome that's created past the floor of the sinus that was all done through this Mitse technique using the Nova Bone and the hydraulic pressure. The MITSA technique, M-I-T-S-A, was the acronym, Minimally Invasive Transcrestal Sinus Augmentation, was introduced by this group. They recommended a three millimeter osteotome be created, osteotomy be created at the ridge, and then placed the cannula of the Nova, Nova Bone Dispenser, which is only 2.8 millimeters, which would fit intimately inside this osteotomy allowing only the bone putty to be introduced vertically and not to come out through the crestal access. So after breaching the sinus, they used the piezo first with the hipsay technique, with that water spray that I showed you earlier, and then they push the putty in as needed. The precise fit of that Nova Bone cannula into a three millimeter osteotomy allowed this to be done with great ease and great um, accuracy.
And one of the most important aspects as well was they looked at their cases and said for each one cc of Nova Bone Putty, you got 10 millimeters of a lift of the Schneiderian membrane. So 0.1 cc's per one millimeter. So osseo densification is something that was introduced to the world by Salah Uis, a periodontist out of Michigan. It was a novel uh, osseo densification procedure that was first introduced to us by him. And we used it mostly for placement of implants and for ridge expansion. But then we started to re recognize we can use this same technology to push the sinus and push bone in front of the drill vertically to allow us to move that Schneiderian membrane away from the floor of the sinus. The denser burr should be introduced into the sinus in increments, first to the floor, then one millimeter, two millimeter, and three millimeter, and all of this is done in reverse. So you're drilling in reverse mode at high RPM. I'm typically using about 1200 RPM in reverse. I get to the floor of the sinus, uh, in forward motion, and then once I get to the floor, I then go in reverse mode, and I never introduce the, the drills more than three millimeters into the sinus. They, they're gone at increments of one millimeter, two millimeters, and three millimeters, all done in reverse mode, or what they call OD mode, uh, osseodentification mode. So let me share with you a case that highlights this incredibly minimally invasive procedure and how exactly to do it. Here's a singular site of first molar with a pneumatized sinus with minimal crestal bone remaining, but certainly three millimeters that can stabilize an implant. Here's the Versa kit on your left. So you're going to realize that you're going to use the pilot and the 2.0 drill to get just within one millimeter of the sinus floor that you measured on your CT scan, and you're gonna drill in forward or what we call cutting mode. Once you get to within one millimeter, you're then going to go to reverse mode, osseodensification mode, and start to go incrementally one millimeter further, first at the 2.3 drill, and then to the three millimeter drill. When you get to the three millimeter drill, you're going to stop and you should be in the sinus. So you don't want to go all the way to the four millimeter drill. This was a case that was done by a colleague of mine, uh, Udata Kerr from India, who did a beautiful job highlighting this and taking these radiographs intraoperatively to show you exactly how this procedure can be done and facilitated. So once you breach the sinus at the three millimeter drill, and you can see that intact membrane, you can now introduce the nova bone into that osteotomy with great precision. And as we said earlier, before I introduce the cannula, I will first go through the osteotomy with a piezo tip, with the hipsay tip, uh, hipsa tip, and blow water through that uh, piezo tip to kind of start the release of the Schneiderian membrane using water hydrodynamics. Once I get it initiated, I then will introduce the nova bone and the cartridge into the sinus, and they come in 0.5 and 0.25 cc applicators. So depending on how much you need, if you need five millimeters of lift, then a 0.5 will do. If you need 0.2, if you need 2.5 millimeters of lift, then a, a 0.25 millimeter cartridge is all that you would need. So we go ahead and we place the cartridge and the applicator tip into the osteotomy and we push that hydrodynamically into the sinus. Once that is done, we slow down the uh, RPMs to 150 RPMs, and we go in with the four millimeter drill at very slow RPM. And what that does is it pushes the bone that we've placed, the Nova bone, and it pushes it laterally and uh, apically to create this little dome effect that you're seeing in the right uh, radiograph. At that point, since we have at least three millimeters of crestal bone, we can stabilize the implant. We can go ahead and simultaneously place our implant into this area. All of this done with a very, very small access crestal incision. No large lateral window, no additional cost of membranes and tacks, and with a very, very small amount of bone. Um, typically with a lateral approach, I'm using at least uh, two grams of bone 
And with a Cressel approach, I'm typically less than one, sometimes a half a gram. So here you can see osteotome technique on the left. One of the reasons that I think that a denser drill of VersaLift is better is when you see the VersaLift on the right, you see a much nicer dome. The bone is spread out much nicer on the right screen. When we did the old osteotome techniques with the mallet, you sometimes would get a unilateral lift of the sinus and you wouldn't get a very nice dome around the bottom of your implant. So the whole concept of osteodensification for me and, and, and some of my colleagues is do not remove the bone, you move the bone. So you're, if you're cutting in OD, reverse setting on, uh, uh, on the Versa drills, the, the bone does not leave the osteotomy, it gets pushed laterally and apically as opposed to a drill that cuts forward. If you look in residual bone heights, if it's less than five millimeters, I prefer a crestal approach. If I get between five and six millimeters, I'm considering a lateral approach. And if I'm at seven millimeters or greater, I don't use any sinus approach. I just use a shorter implant. So for me, this is sort of a little bit different than what you may have seen in some of the courses you've taken. This is what we do teach at the Salama Training Center. Residual bone width. If it's less than five millimeters, four millimeters or less, I'm looking at a lateral approach so I can also do a GBR to expand the ridge. If it's five millimeters or greater, I'm considering a crestal approach. So as we wind down, I think really interesting for me is to look at the questions that we asked originally and maybe to circle back and get an idea of when would we do each type of procedure and which way would you do it. I try to give you some parameters today. I told you about ridge height. I think when it's less than five millimeters and with ridge width, if it's greater than five millimeters, those are optimal cases for a crestal approach. And as I said as well, classical thinking as I get beyond seven millimeters, I'm not thinking sinus approach at all. I'm thinking shorter implants. And in the area between five, six, and seven millimeters, I think you can use a bump approach or a lateral approach if in fact the ridge is narrow. So you really have to be very much a diagnostician and measure the cases always using cone beam CT technology. I thank you for your attention as we head into the Q&A part of the discussion. Awesome, thank you, Dr. Salama. Uh, that was some really great information. Um, yeah, so now it's time for the Q&A portion. We have some good ones coming in already. Um, reminder, if you'd still like to ask a question, uh, there's a button in the top right of your screen. You can go in there and put the questions in and we'll try to get those to uh, Dr. Salama. So uh, let's kick this off here. Um, let's see, how long do you wait to place the implant after the crustal lift? And then how long do you wait after a lateral, lateral lift? Or is it different time frames? Well, you know, before we head into that, I, I would like to go go through a couple of the questions that we that I want to highlight. So let's just do that first. I'm sorry, Eric. Yeah. Just want to kind of go through. That's the question for a second, and that will yeah. give them time. So number one, I asked a question at the beginning of the webinar, and I said, "When should you consider a crestal ver approach versus a lateral approach?" And one of the one of the, the answers to me would be when there's no pathology present in the sinus when you're limiting your procedure to one or two implants, when there's adequate ridge width, as I talked about, ridge height is less than five millimeters. And if the ridge height is greater than five millimeters, typically with a bump approach, I'm really only using PRF or PRGF alone. Question number two, which I posed at the beginning was what techniques are available? You have specialized bird technologies for access. So you do have uh, neurosurgical drills, diamond drills that cut bone and don't, don't cut the sidereal membrane. You have hydrodynamic techniques like the piezo and hipsate technique. You have a balloon elevation. Um, some of them use latex balloons and others use different types of materials, make sure that the patient doesn't have a latex allergy. And I then talked about using the Versa and the V-Lift with osteodensification. Question number three that I posed was, is bone grafting a requirement for successful sinus augmentation? And the answer to that is no, not according to the scientific evidence. All you need is space maintenance for the blood clot. 
The problem is that it requires more time to get, to get calcification and density of that bone. Without bone grafting though, it minimizes risk. So if I can't see and I can't confirm that I didn't tear the sinus on a minimal bump procedure, I'll sometimes only use PRGF or PRF alone. When a greater lift is needed, I always suggest a bone graft. Question number four, how much residual crustal bone is required for simultaneous implant placement? Scientific review has different qualifications. Depending upon which articles and where you look at, the literature has different suggestions. So a safe suggestion would be three millimeters. Implant stability is the final determining factor. It's really, can you stabilize your implant and keep them parallel? And in the end, it's the clinical clinician's decision based upon their experience level. There is, is no clear answer in the literature. So question number four, uh, question number five, is how much lift can be expect, expected with these varying crestal approaches? Number one, I would say you need to get trained. This is not something you can see this, this webinar and then do it tomorrow. You need to go get training. Um, you need to know how to use these materials. Live training is critical, hands-on training, very important. So it's technique sensitive. With an osteotome approach, typically three to six millimeters in the literature has been posed. With a V-lift, typically for me, three to eight millimeters. And with a hydraulic approach, 10 to 12 millimeters has been pretty much routine. So those were the five questions that we posed earlier. Right. Let's go to the questions now that you had gotten and uh, we, can, we can touch on that now as well. Okay, so one of them was talking about um, when you, when you uh, have your osteotome, you cover that with anything in a two-stage approach before you close the flap. So you've placed your bone graft in there, you cover that or do you just close the flap? I always cover with fibrin or collagen membrane, always. So whether it's a lateral window or crestal approach, I'm always covering it with something if I'm leaving it open. So lateral approach always going to have a collagen membrane. It's going to be a long acting collagen membrane. I'm not going to use a drapeable short acting membrane. It has to be something that will last at least four to five months. Otherwise, you can get invasion of soft tissue from the flap. With a crestal approach, typically I'm doing this simultaneously with implant placement. And in those cases, if I have fiber and I'll use it, but I, I don't think it's a requirement. But if I'm doing a two-stage approach, I will always place fibrin or collagen at the crest over the crestal access osteotomies. Okay. And what is the best approach for infracturing a slanted sinus floor, in your opinion? The best approach to, fr to, to fracture or the and best approach to fractures? For infracturing a, a slanted sinus floor is the question. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question because those are one of the most, most challenging areas. So I'm not a fan any longer, as you can tell. I'm not using osteotome and mallets. I think those days are over. The, the, the complications of vertigo and any inner ear disturbances are just not warranted. And if I fracture an anterior wall in particular, which I've done with a osteotome technique, you will certainly tear through the Schneiderian membrane. So the best way to, to access those slanted floors, to me, has been using the Versa lift or the V lift. Okay, great. How would you handle it if the sinus floor isn't even, uh, such as the mesial side's higher than the distal side? It's very often, it's almost routine that that's always the case. I'm very, it's, it'll be a nice day in the clinic when I have a perfectly flat sinus floor. So it always is going to happen. That's why you have to use instrumentology that gives you laser markings on your drills, whether it's a V-lift or whether I'm using neurosurgical drills from different providers. You need to know where those laser markings are and, and access it depending upon the, the uh remaining residual crestal floor. So I'm three millimeters in the molar and four or five millimeters in the bicuspid. I'm using different drills to access those depths. And once I'm into the, into the sinus, I can then have the lift from one to the other because as you lift one with the hydrodynamic, it has an effect on the other. So some of the best vertical crestal procedures that I've done has been with 
multiple implants next to each other, like two implants, because as I lift one with the water, I can also lift the other and they meet in the middle and they create a very, very nice uh, elasticity of the Schneiderian membrane without tearing it. Okay. And so as far as medical history, is there any type of a contraindication for a sinus lift that would be different from other procedures? Yeah, I mean, uh, if you have a patient, uh, what we've seen in, um, in back in the late 90s, there was a consensus conference in San Francisco with the Academy of Os Integration. And they said that one of the biggest uh, uh, medical histories you have to look at is a patient with chronic sinusitis, chronic sinus disease. Those patients have the highest risk of post-operative complications. So I think that a, a person that has any type of sinus pathology by his ENT prior to you doing the procedure. Second thing is, as we say on the article, I, I think I shared early in the presentation, uh, 2018, looking at the success rate of sinus augmentation procedures were very high, but in the, in the paper, it d discussed the fact that smokers have a higher risk of implant loss and potential sinus uh, complications. So I would think that chronic sinusitis, a patient with chronic sinus disease is a, is a patient that you got to really watch out for, make sure you get clearance. And a smoker needs to understand if they can't stop smoking, that they are a higher risk for these procedures. Okay. Then we had a couple of questions come in about the, uh, the diamond burr and the mushroom and cobra tips that you were talking about, um, yes. about who makes those. Yes. Neobiotech. Um, yeah, but... it's a Korean, Korean implant manufacturer. Uh, they are, I've worked with those products for the better part of 13 or 14 years. Uh, they were the ones that first introduced the neurosurgical drills to dentistry um, because they worked in the cranium during brain surgery to enter the cranium, which is extremely dense bone, and not tear the meninges of the brain. So they took the same technology from our neurosurgical colleagues and applied it to uh, the sinus procedure. And I started using their, their, their uh, kits uh, about 14 years ago, and I, I think they're the best ones on the market. Okay. And if you have, a, if you do end up having a perforation and a crustal approach, let's say you can see the membrane, um, you're using your tests to see if there's a perforation. Are there ever times that you try to um, either um, plug that up and continue with the crustal or do you go immediately to lateral? That's the best question so far. So whoever wrote it, they can, they can know that's the best question so far. Okay, so here's where clinical experience comes in and, and how much of a risk taker you are. The larger the perforation would lead me to abort the procedure and then go to a lateral approach. So if it's usually my cutoff is about five millimeters in diameter. If it's a pinhole, if it's a small little tear of a millimeter or so, I'll try to lift laterally and, and then place a collagen wound dressing or fibrin or, or both and see if I can seal the tear. If I feel confident, I'll do it. I can then introduce water, look at my mirror, do the Valsalva maneuver, see if they, if they have the tear is still, uh, still an issue. Uh, or if I see that I've sealed it adequately, I will then proceed with the procedure. Now, having said that, it's really important what I'm about to say. If you know you had a tear during a crestal procedure, I prefer for sure to use no particulated bone. It's either going to be fibrin alone or it's going to be fibrin and Nova bone putty. The reason is the Nova bone putty will not dissipate in the sinus and then end up floating into the osteomalal complex causing significant infection. What I've seen with the Nova bone is it's because it's a putty, it stays put and it doesn't drift into the sinus causing these significant post-operative complications that you can get when you introduce bone particles through a tear in the Schneiderian membrane. So uh, absolutely not a fan of pushing particulated bone in a sinus that I know has a tear, even if I think I've repaired it. Right. Okay, yeah, that's great information. Um, so we talked about um, the width and the height of the ridge uh, impacting which technique you decide to go with is the the like the size of that the number of teeth 
Does that come into play when you're factoring whether you're going to go crustal or go lateral? Yeah, I mean, if, if I'm if I'm doing a an area where I'm looking at four, you know, let's say two bicuspids and two molars, it's pretty large. I'm probably just going to go with a lateral approach. To me, it's it it wouldn't make sense for me to do it through a crestal approach. It's already a large area that I'm dealing with. So if I have a severely pneumatized sinus and a large edential span, I'm probably I'm pretty much going with a lateral approach. If I have one or two teeth next to one another. That area to me is an excellent area to do this with a crestal approach. So one to two teeth, I'm doing crestal if I have the ridge width and have adequate height. If I have three or four teeth uh, and a very large pneumatized sinus, I'm probably going to end up with a, a lateral approach. It allows me to, uh, to uh, access it all in one shot and make sure that I have enough bone to stabilize the future implants. Okay. And I think we have time for one more question. What kind of antibiotic um, protocol do you give after these procedures? Like, is it very, That's with, whether it's allergic? Yeah. If, if they're not allergic to uh, amoxicillin, penicillin, uh, I'm typically going to use um, flagyl, metronidazole, uh, and augmentin. Um, and if they are allergic, I'll do that in combination. So both of those drugs would be used. Uh, over eight days, um, and uh, so I'm using a metronidazole and augmentin, or if they're allergic, then I would utilize uh, clindamycin, and uh, those are the, the two antibiotics of, of choice for me. Okay, awesome. Well, Dr. Salama, um, thank you so much for your time. For everybody watching here, uh, thank you so much for watching and tuning in. We hope you enjoyed the, the webinar. Um, yeah. It was great information, Dr. Salama, so thank you so much. Well, I really appreciate it. I, I certainly uh, I'm, I'm very, very uh, grateful to Osteogenics as they're a, they are a sponsor and supporter of my, uh, my training courses. Um, I'm very fond of the, the materials uh, that I'm able to utilize. Uh, the Regen materials in my office all come through uh, Osteogenics and I've had great success with it and I appreciate the relationship that I've had. And certainly um, Nova Bone being one of the products we feature today is obviously uh, one of those products that's sold through Osteogenics. So I appreciate it. And I'm glad I was able to share my information with the audience. Thank you so much, Eric. And thank you so much, Osteogenics. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Take care, guys. Have a good evening.